Thank you, Christy. That was lovely. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at the First United Church of East Syracuse. Whether you are here in person or are viewing this later on one of our social media sites, we're glad that you joined us this morning. I do have one announcement. Most of you may have received it via email, um, and that is um, regarding Sunday school for our young people. We would like to have someone available and ready to teach young people during our regular Sunday services. We have a proposal from Dale to, cre to create a list of volunteers who would pre be prepared to teach on a cycle of Sundays, much like our worship assistants do. Um, these folks would accompany young people out of the sanctuary after the children's sermon to either the lounge or the Christian ed room downstairs. Dale would provide materials each week and we'd like to begin this as soon as possible and continue throughout the year, except for holiday times like Labor Day, Thanksgiving week, Christmas week, etc. cetera. Um, if you're interested in helping out, you can contact Dale. And we have a sign-up sheet out on the table in the narthex. So if you're interested in helping, you can talk to Dale, who is here today, or you can just sign up for one of the weeks coming up. And Dale will have materials. I know he brought them today, just in case we had any young folks here today. Um, if there's no one here, then you're f free to sit through the service. If there's someone here, then you would accompany them after Pastor Eric talks to the children and just take the materials and talk to the kids during the rest of the worship service. Are there any other announcements? Dale? I've got the next two weeks covered. And I'll be back from vacation. So if anybody wants to start helping out in August, in case kids show up, or in case some of the youngsters want to go downstairs and get away from there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Anything in August from then on, if you want to, that's great. And if you don't want to, that's okay. We don't get any kids to show up anyway, so. Okay, but once in a while we do have a couple young young folks, and um, this would give them the opportunity to see a different side of worship and the church. Okay, are there any other announcements? Okay, then we'll move on to the lighting of our candles. We light the candle of remembrance each week for those in the military and their families, for our veterans, first responders, and all those in harm's way. We light the candle of peace. It reminds us to pray for God's peace in our homes, our community, our nation, and in our world. Please rise as you are able and join me in our call to worship. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those to turn to him in their hearts. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Righteousness will go before him and may make a path for his steps. Our first hymn this morning is number 262, Heal Me, Hands of Jesus.
Let us join together in our prayer of yearning. Lord, we confess our jealousy that we spend too much time envying what our neighbor has and not enough time appreciating what we have, that we get too tied up in fantasies and not invested in our paths toward you. And now, the prayer of yearning that we will say, to, oh no, the words of assurance, my apologies. Let us cultivate an attitude of gratitude, remembering that we are our own greatest competitor, especially topical with the Olympics coming up. Let us make room for God in our hearts, paving a path for God's steps with our gratitude, amen. And now, in celebration of that gratitude for community, let us pass the peace. And maybe we can even say to each other, I'm grateful you're here this morning. Please be seated. Our Hebrew Bible reading this morning is from 2 Samuel, chapter 6, verses 14 to 23. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place, inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their houses. David returned to bless his household. But Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants made, as any vulgar fellow might shamelessly uncover himself. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me in place of your father and all his household to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord, that I have danced before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in my own eyes. 
but by the maids of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our next hymn is number 261, Lord of the Dance. Our Gospel reading this morning is the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses 14 to 29. King Herod heard of it, 
for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah, and others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved Yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king set a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. When the girl gave it to her mother, when his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. How are we doing today? It is so good to be in the house of the Lord, to have a responsive crowd, and to be in the air conditioning. <laughs> I'm from the south, so, so, so sadly I'm very used to the air conditioning. So if you come and see me during my regular office hours this week on Tuesday and Wednesday from 9 to 3, including a lunch break, um, I will usually have the AC and a fan in my, in my um, office going at the same time. Joan's laughing because she sees it all the time. And uh, that's, that's just for me, and promise if you speak up loud, I will hear you. Um, but uh, yeah, it's so good to see you guys here, especially during the summer. And um, I suppose, because uh, I've, I've portioned out at least one of my weekend days on Friday and Saturday to travel around this region to get to know it, and because uh, my family is crazy that way. And uh, so I guess I'll have to do a segment in my sermons called Pastor's Adventures to tell you what kind of tourist stuff I've been getting up to. And on Friday, I went to Auburn, 45 minutes west of here, where the seminary that helped credential me, uh, which is now in New York City, started out. Um, so they moved to New York City in the Great Depression, but before then, they were up there because they were known as the Frontier Seminary. So back then, Auburn, New York was the wild, wild west, um, which is hilarious, except for when I drove into Auburn and said, wait, this does look a little like the wild, wild west. Um, but I was very happy to go see Harriet Tubman's house and to hear from a tour guide who had been there longer than I've been alive. It would make for a great church or presbytery trip in the future just because it's so close and easy to get to and it's very educational and very accessible. Um, now, I, I, these two texts, I didn't pick them for today. They're in the lectionary, the year-round list of texts that are used. And I say that because, as you may have heard, as you may have seen, they're both very political and very about um, arguments and relationships. I didn't expect it to be that topical after yesterday. 
um, after the assassination attempt, and we will lift up those prayers later in the service. But just to say that this sermon, I wasn't intending for uh, the topic of political violence in the Bible to be this topical. Um, so just know that uh, I'm trying to react to this and build around it. Um, some people on my Facebook groups that I'm a member of for clergy were like, yesterday they said, well, we're throwing our sermon in the trash can, and I didn't quite want to do that. Um, so you'll see, I'll try to adapt it to what's going on today. Now these are two passages that are dripping with royal intrigue. First, with King David dancing scantily clad, basically. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, and which I'd never read before this week. And second, about, uh, so it's a king dancing, and then a daughter of a king dancing for a king in Herodias dancing for King Herod, which is followed by an assassination. If you like dramatic stories of backstabbing and plotting uh, and royal intrigue in history, but also in shows like Game of Thrones, the currently airing House of the Dragon, The Wire, and The Sopranos, anything where people are scheming against each other, even The Godfather, these are the Bible stories for you. And it kind of just reinforces, as a few of the shows airing, as like House of the Dragon and Game of Thrones does, just how stupid and arbitrary violence can be, especially political violence, where kings and rulers wake up one day, or even assassins, and say, you know what, I want to be famous, or I want to do this just to do it. And then they do it. That really is sometimes how it happens. Like, that's why John Lennon was killed, because Mark David Chapman wanted quick fame, and he fully knew what he was doing. There was no motivation other than being famous. So we're looking for meanings in this, and sometimes it's just bafflingly simple. And having said that, I will say I'll mostly focus on the story of David and Michal and sprinkle in some Mark towards the end. Thank you, Joan, for pronouncing that name correctly. Um, it, puts me on, it puts me on my heels for sure, because now I have to pronounce it correctly. Um, I'm delighted to say that both churches' liturgists today, including our partner church in Columar, pronounced it correctly. So I'm very happy that uh, that happened. Now, before I uh, get started, the main scholar I read for this sermon is a man by the name of Dr. Stephen L. McKenzie. He's a world-renowned Hebrew Bible professor who wrote a biography of King David. In addition to that, over a decade ago, he taught a fresh-faced young whippersnapper from East Tennessee named Eric Adamchek. So Stephen L. McKenzie was, in fact, my first semester professor in my Bible course um, when I was, I didn't know whether I wanted to go into ministry or not. I didn't know, um, much about the, well, I knew more than a lot of people about the Bible, but not a whole lot, and um, I just look at the draw in my Sunday school growing up, and um, so I kind of fell into having him as my professor at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee, not Memphis, New York, I have to make that distinction, um, the big Memphis uh, southwest of here, and he also, so as a world-renowned scholar of King David, Dr. McKenzie has a passion for weird Bible passages like this especially in the Hebrew Bible, which is the name I use for the Old Testament, which is what Jewish scholars would prefer, and it's honestly just a better description of what the Old Testament is anyway, that it's mostly in Hebrew. Um, so you can imagine me as a 19-year-old liking weird stuff like this, and that has continued into my ministry just a decade later, because the Bible is weird, guys. <laughs> like, we kind of have gotten used to the idea of you know, turning water into wine, being normal, but that's a weird story when you give it a second thought. I just want to tell one story about Dr. McKenzie to tell, to, for, uh, to illustrate our relationship, and it happened, um, I think, my, my senior year, sometime in my senior year, um, and I was talking to, a, I think, the guy who ended up writing my recommendation for seminary, and we came over to talk to Dr. McKenzie, and uh, I told him, he was like, oh, which seminaries are you applying to? I told him my six, and he looks at me and he goes, I'd be surprised if you didn't get into every one with a good scholarship, which was the first time I'd ever heard that. <laughs> I think up to that time, I was like, oh, that's good. Um, and at that point, I didn't know, and I was applying to six seminaries, which is more than a lot of people do, um, just to see how much money I could get from each one and which one might be the right fit, um, kind of like a lot of students do with college nowadays. And um, 
And uh, so that was the first encouragement I really heard as far as being able to get into these things to the point where um, I talked to my best friend, at the, one of my best friends at the time, Treston, who had gone through that class with me, and he goes, well, I guess he knows what he's talking about, so that's good. You should take that as encouragement. We were both like, okay, now I feel better about this. So he's not just a weird and funny guy. He's someone who saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, which is honestly the opposite of what happens in this passage with Samuel refusing to see the gifts of his wife, Michal, who, by the way, is one of his 10 known wives, at least. He had at least 10, um, which was kind of sadly common back then. In our story, David has just become king of Israel through killing his political rivals and military conquest. Everything he did was about winning the war, which has been common for any war fought by wannabe monarchs. And that included his marriage, or marriages, which were purely for political convenience and not love. And I should say this right now, yes, this is dehumanizing to women which was unfortunately common at the time, that women were passed around like favors to be won um, and betrothed uh, because of convenience or what kind of riches it would bring. Um, think something like Disney's uh, Aladdin, which I'll reference again in this, in this sermon, um, when Jasmine is betrothed to someone and she doesn't want to uh, marry that person. It was very common back then, except most of the time the princess was told to suck it up. Which brings us to Samuel and Michal, who's actually the daughter of King Saul, David's predecessor and nemesis for the throne. Their young marriage gave him more legitimacy to the throne. He wasn't related to Saul by blood, but now by marriage. And this passage takes place early in that, that, king, that kingly reign, when he's establishing a capital in Jerusalem as a compromise between North and South Israel just like Washington, D.C. was a compromise between the North and South colonies. Hence the elevation of the Ark of the Covenant, which is believed to be God's house. To celebrate his victory, David dances around in celebration in what's called a linen ephod. And as with a lot of biblical, um, uh, I tried to find out exactly what this was, and it turns out there's no agreement. Scholars say it could be a loincloth, or an apron, or a colorful sundress-like garment, so he could be dancing around like a young woman wearing a sundress in the summer or, um, or like Tarzan. The point is, didn't expect for this sermon to get so Disney-like. The point is, he's wearing priestly undergarments that make him more scantily clad than would be normal for anybody, but especially a king. But they're priestly undergarments. So he's saying, I own all this, but in an overly casual and uncomfortable way, that includes partying with the common people and giving out food. As you can imagine, this wasn't normal for a king to do. So in essence, David is celebrating his inauguration in the weirdest way possible. Think Syracuse native Tom Cruise in Risky Business, sliding down the floor and dancing in his underwear. This is the royal version of that. Now, while most of us would find this fun, Michal watches him dance, and in verse 16, she, it says she despised him in her heart. Then in verse 20, when David comes into the house, she declares, just dripping with sarcasm, how the king of Israel honored himself today. Uncovering himself today before the eyes of the servant's maids, as any vulgar fellow might shamelessly uncover himself. Her statement is pointed, judgmental, and meant to hurt. And it's worth asking, are we seeing a normal spousal fight here, or is there something more? And if you've heard me preach at any point before, you know there's always something more to this. You see, Michal was supportive to David even at the point of death. Early in that war, when David was running from King Saul, Michal helped him escape through a window, not unlike Rapunzel. There's another Disney reference. Michal used a window to save his life, and at great personal risk, as she surely would have been decapitated if she was found out. She helped him escape through a window, and years later, she feels trapped behind a window. She's watching him through the window after helping him escape out of one. So the meaning of windows has flipped on its head. It's done a complete 180 from a moment of her bond with David to how separate they are. 
So what happened in those years? That's also a matter of some debate. But David's response to her is very telling and equally biting and sarcastic. He says, it was before the Lord who chose me in place of your father and all his household to appoint me as prince over Israel. In essence, God ordained him as king and he can do whatever he wants, including dancing in his underwear. So this unusual act is actually showing how much power he has. And it's kind of weird that he feels the need to explain this to Michal because she supported that claim the whole way. David's so defensive, he forgets how much Michal helped him out when he was in a rough spot. This reminds us of how often people get overlooked in religious communities, how someone might attribute everything to a preacher or speaker and not to the people who set up the spaces for them to speak or the refreshments after a service, which I'm sure many of you who have served on council or as ruling elders can relate to. How people working behind the scenes can get ignored or lost. Michal is an example of that. Between David's condescending tone and his multiple wives, I think it's safe to say there's a little neglect going on here, that Michal isn't getting that much attention or nurturing from her husband. She helped him win the throne, and now she's just relegated to being another wife. In this moment, Michal can't see the good that David is doing because she's consumed by the bad he's done to her. In turn, David can't see where Michal is coming from because he thinks that God approves of everything he does and is signing a blank check just because he's the king. David has dehumanized his wife so much he thinks he has to remind her of things she already knows. Even over 2,000 years later, we all have fights like this with loved ones or co-workers, forgetting the other person's humanity because we're so wrapped up in our own stuff. In moments like that, logic goes completely out the window in our brains and we give in to emotion, often saying or doing something that requires us to say, I didn't mean that. We can dehumanize someone in the blink of an eye, whether we mean to or not. And even more baffling to us, those moments don't come from our minds, but from our hearts and our bodies as a trauma response, making them even more difficult to control. Whereas consequences of our fights are usually a fractured relationship or anger or depression, which are all valid, Michal's is far worse. For her outburst, she is punished by not having children for the rest of her life. One word for that, yikes. While it's not clear whether David willed this or God did, I, I agree with scholars that it was probably David who didn't want an heir with Saul's blood and his blood running around, since that person would have a better claim to the throne and could start a revolution among those peasants who he's feeding. That's good political policy, but it's terrible for David's private life. It cuts off Michal from an essential way for women to have power in that time. You see, if women didn't have kids and their husband passed away or they were kicked out, they were left destitute. In refusing her a child, David is taking away not just her bodily autonomy, but her economic mobility, the main way she could make a living, which is very sad for the time. He's creating a situation where, in public, she has to pretend everything is fine to make everyone uncomfortable, or comfortable, I should say. And how many times have we had to do that to ourselves? To swallow a concern or emotion that's so nagging and important, but feels like it would be a burden to our loved ones and neighbors. Michal is being blocked from one of the few things she could truly have simply because of who her dad is. So looking at this, as biting and sarcastic as she was to David, I wonder if she could have yelled at David harder or about how he actually treats her in refusing her a child and keeping her in the house. Michal's story shows us that, unlike David, we have to be careful in how we treat others because we might be giving preferential treatment to someone without even realizing it, that they don't that they might feel the need to have to suppress themselves and emotion they're feeling or who they are to fit in with us. 
This has always been something in human nature, but I think it's especially true in our social media age. That we see other people on lavish vacations or enjoying their job or family, and we think their life is perfect and we're not measuring up. Even if we know up here that's not true, down here we can't help but be fooled when we see it a lot. Never mind that it's filtered and we only see what people want us to see. People's public lives have tricked us into thinking their private lives are perfect, which can never be the case. Knowing that, we have to think about how to include people in our private lives, not just when it look good, looks good in public. King Herod, as I'll talk for only a couple minutes about this, but King Herod adds another layer onto that in those private failures which can bleed out into bad policy. Now we'll be moving from a dance done by a king to a dance done for a king, the second dance. If the David Michal story was a political drama about marriage, this is more of a dark comedy. Because here, King Herod, who you guys have heard of at Christmas, is the ruler of Palestine. He's like a governor under Caesar's supervision. And he shares his Jewish faith with Jesus and John. So he is appointed as a Jewish ruler specifically by Caesar. His daughter Herodias, which isn't a particularly creative name, they just slapped three letters onto the end of Herod. It's like if I named my firstborn daughter Erica, like they wouldn't be particularly creative, especially since my last initial is A. So Herodias dances at a party in her father's royal court. She does so well that she gets a wish, much like Robin Williams' genie might grant. It's weird here that Herodias asks for a guy's head and not, you know, half the kingdom like he's offering. In that moment, she couldn't have even run off. She could have just said, oh, half the land. That sounds good. Especially since I bet Michal would have taken that offer. She's not even greedy in a way that really helps her bottom line. She could have asked for riches or even the wars to stop, but she doesn't. And to me, this indicates that Herod clearly spoils his child to the point where he can't even say no to her. He's like one of those parents with brats and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. No discipline for her and no boundaries for him. She might as well be turning into a blueberry at this point. If this story seems overly silly, that's actually the point. This is a deeply sarcastic portrayal of Herod. Mark is trying, and I think succeeding, to portray him as inept, which honestly lets Herod off the hook for what probably really happened, ordering the beheading himself for political reasons. But it's meant to portray him as an idiot, as someone who only did it because, his, not only because his daughter told him to, but because he's bound by royal law, that he can't say no, or feels he can't say no. And that's what Mark is doing here exposing us to just how incompetent Herod might be. He's trying to make sure his audience in first to second century Palestine knew their king was human just like them and didn't have the absolute authority he thought. So it would feel better rebelling against him in ways big and small. And that's the common human thread among these passages, that biblical figures are human just like us. And just like us, they give into their emotions so much they forget how to serve others. That's the lesson here, that like these kings, we have private imperfections we don't want to show to the public. But ignoring those problems doesn't make them go away. It makes them grow and have more power over us, as we see with David and Herod. So let us confront these imperfections and failures head on, embracing them as things that aren't bad or good, but simply exist. Let us be willing to open up about them and to encourage others to be vulnerable too. And as we do that, I also want us to reclaim dancing because unfortunately, dancing gets a bad rap here because it's done either by um, King David in the midst of a time when uh, to kind of show off his power in a power hungry way, and it's done by Herodias to get a wish. I want us to dance because we feel like it, because we feel the joy. And not only that, but to invite others to dance, to leave our egos at the door and make our actions an invitation to our neighbors. 
Let us work towards choosing help each and every day and to stop the exclusion of women, of prophets, to call us out on our imperfections. Let us embrace those weaknesses as much as our strengths, remembering our mutual humanity and resisting the need to pretend everything is perfect. And make no mistake, that's a hard thing to do, especially after yesterday in a political assassination attempt which you'd think would give us the opposite message that being too vulnerable is a mistake. But even with that, it's the right thing to do, and even a practice of nonviolence, as David and Herod show us how imperfections can escalate into violence. So in being vulnerable, I want us to do our part towards ending that violent cycle of history by spreading vulnerability far and wide. Let us sprint towards a more honest kindness, like Dr. McKenzie showed in encouraging me towards seminary. Instead of forcing others to observe us through a window, let us join them and let them join us in the dance of vulnerability, in being joyful in our vulnerabilities and in telling others it's okay to be vulnerable too. Let us be examples of that now and forevermore. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and amen. And now, in that exact same, um, oh no, we're not in the joys and concerns yet. So let's think about that when we come to joys and concerns as we take up our offering. If you are present here, you may place your tithes and offerings in the basket in the narthex. Or if you are at home, please mail them to the church at 823 Franklin Park Drive, East Syracuse, 13057. Christy will lead us in our doxology. And let us join in the dedication. Let us dance with joy, knowing that God has given us so many good things in this life. Let us be the people who are in love with serving, looking for every opportunity in our lives, so all God's people may dance in joy and gratitude to God. Let us be seated for the joys and concerns where we can show that vulnerability here in real time. Uh, I just want to say it's a joy that my dad, who was in the hospital for five days, has come home and is doing well. And uh, we have a couple of rock stars in our family, and we are very happy for them. What's his name? John. Karen's dad, John, home from the hospital. Karen's dad john who was in the hospital for five days is home and we're happy for that anyone else lynn we're glad to see you here thank you john it's good to be here uh, my surgery went well much better than i actually expected um too my sister lisa's been here here with me and, and, and helping, and just, she'll tell you I sleep more than anything else. But, but that's okay. That's why she's here. <laughs> so um, just you know, the joy of successful surgery and the, and, uh, the joy of family and the joy of sisters and support. And, and, and also I, I thank everyone here for, for their prayers through this, through this journey of mine. Thank you.
Well, there are certainly crazies on both ends of the spectrum. I think most of us lie someplace in the middle. But after last night, I'd just like us to all to pray that sanity will take hold and we won't have a bloodbath. And people can recognize that people are people, whether you're Christian or Muslim or a Reformed Druid or you're Republican or Democrat or Independent or whatever it is you are. May God help us all to get through this. Amen. Anyone else? Thank you. Let us all go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we're here in so many in-between times. Whether you're waiting for a diagnosis, for further news in the media, for the end of summer, for the beginning of fall, whatever we are waiting for, and we are all waiting for something, may you be with us in the waiting. Tom Petty once said, waiting is the hardest part. And boy, do we know that. But you sit with us in the waiting. You know our hearts, Lord, and you know so much about us, better than we know ourselves, the one being we can say that about. And so we thank you for being with us, when we, even when we haven't felt it, and pray that we can just feel your presence, because you're there no matter what. We give our concerns, Lord, to the one bystander who is dead from the shooting in Pennsylvania yesterday, for the shooter's family who are having to reckon with so much publicly, for whoever has survived this. And we pray, Lord, as Dale said so eloquently, for no more bloodbaths based on identity, that whatever happens next, that no viol more violence should occur, that it stops here and now, and that we do our part to keep this society nonviolent as Martin Luther King and so many before and after him have done. In the same way, Lord, we remember that despite what the news would have us believe, life still goes on. We pray for Karen's dad, John, coming home from the hospital after five days. We are so grateful it was only five days and that he is back with family being supported. Thank you for bringing John back to us. We also give joy for Lynn's recovery, that the surgery went better than expected, that Lisa is here to support her, and that Bill is here to support her as well. May they take care of themselves as well as her, knowing that we all are human and have needs and can rest, and that just sleeping is not a bad thing. We also give thanks this week for our birthdays on July 18th, Grace and Carr, and on July 21st of Dick Law. Thank you, Lord, for keeping these saints with us. May they remember how much we love them and truly feel celebrated this week. And now we lift up, and we also pray, Lord, for the people in Palestine, in Sudan, in Israel, in Russia, in Ukraine, for all of those who are hearing gunshots way more than we are and whose mortality rate is far higher. We pray for those people as well. Now let us lift up all the prayers that we are not able to say out loud. As we lift up those prayers and so many more that are in our hearts, we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us as we forgive our debtors. It is not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And now let us sing together hymn number 2196, In the Faith We Sing, We Walk by Faith and Not by Sight.
And now, let us remain standing for the benediction. Friends, family, let us wear our humanity like a badge of honor to open up to others, to speak up to include all God's children. Let us start to break the cycle of personal and societal dehumanization this day forward and forevermore, dancing towards a world where vulnerability and love are encouraged at every turn. Amen and amen. <laughs>